Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our listeners all over the world. I'm Barry Miller, your host at the Revamp Podcast. Today, I'm privileged to have Jesse Rabbits, the Senior Manager of the Deal Desk at GitLab. He um, is a really cool individual, a very um, educated professional. And I actually found Jesse when I was doing... I don't know, I was Googling something about uh, sales processes and um, something around that. And he actually manages a public, if you will, guidebook on how on, on the deal that's for the GitLab team, and it's public. This is going to be a big part of our conversation today, in addition to understanding what is the deal desk and um, some very specific questions I have for the deal desk team and how they work with other uh, individuals, including sales, and how they move sales forward. Um, so Jesse, thanks for joining. Thanks for having me, Barry. It's uh, it's good to be here, and I'm really excited to talk about Deal Desk. Let's awesome. nerd out. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> so you guys, Jesse's awesome. Uh, so Jesse, before we nerd out, tell me a little bit more about yourself. Uh, maybe your background, how you got into Deal Desk, uh, what you did beforehand. Yeah, sure. So uh, first of all, I'm based in New York City. Uh, I grew up um, sort of in the tri-state area, and I've been in New York for over a decade now. Um, my background, I, I've kind of been all over the place. I, I studied uh, journalism and English literature in school and then went straight into law school. Uh, it had always been my intention to be a lawyer, and I loved law school. I came out of it excited, and then I took the bar exam. And the trauma of that event and the reality <laughs> of the job market made me realize that I didn't want to put on a suit every day and sit in a law firm for 15 hours. So I had to pivot and I, I landed at a tech company on a legal team um, doing a uh, sort of like a contracts manager role, really you know, facilitating contracts, contract signatures, light negotiation with our sales team. And that's how I, I got into the tech space of of kind of marginally being involved with tech sales and learning about tech sales. And that role eventually kind of turned into a deal desk. I think throughout that process and that time, I started to get closer to sales and kind of reach a little further into their world than just the legal guy and what the legal guy would, would handle. And, uh, you know, that really showed me ways that I could help improve the sales process and, and quote to cash. And um, naturally uh, that, that turned into a deal desk there. And, and here we are, I'm on my second one now. Here we are. All right, well, that's awesome story. Uh, thank you for telling us that. Uh, I saw, I think it was Grammarly, they have like a legal operations position. Is that the type of position? Was that your, your position name when you joined that first company? The, the title was actually contracts lead. So I was leading a, a small contracts group within the legal team, um, light operations, but we actually also had legal operations. So they were separate, uh, mm -hmm. but, but I was sort of uh, naturally the owner of our CPQ tool, for example, and deal structure. And that was sort of my entry into sales deals and, and getting more involved there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, it's, it's, it's really interesting to see CPQ touch so many different functions, not just sales, but also legal. Um, so cool. For our guests that don't know what a deal desk is, maybe you could elaborate what that means to you and maybe what also, if it means something different than other people, what it means in general. Uh, you know, I think, I think there's, there's an important reason uh, behind that question. And, and, and the, the background is a deal desk kind of looks different everywhere. It's still this relatively niche concept that's starting to expand uh, in the industry and in various industries, really. Uh, now, for me, a deal desk is kind of a, a core cross-functional team that facilitates quote to cash. Now, what I mean by that is, is kind of a, a deal desk works with sales teams, a deal desk works with finance teams, a deal desk works with legal teams. And a deal desk can be part of one of those teams. So at GitLab, our deal desk is part of sales operations. In my previous uh, position at a different company, uh, it was part of legal first and then actually moved to finance. So I've been on a deal desk that was under three different functions at, at a company. 
And they're all similar. You are really, uh, you're, you're spending your day liaising on, on deal desk. You're, you're working to facilitate these deals, whether that's uh, talking to, speaking to deal structure, speaking to you know, various business approvals, revenue recognition and other financial needs, um, uh, legal issues that come into play with deals. You know, can we, can we structure a deal this way under our policies? Do we need specific language written to protect ourselves, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It, it really looks different everywhere, but to, to simplify what a deal desk is to me, a deal desk is the center of um, the deal wheel. We're the hub, right? And, and on the, on that wheel, you, you've got these spokes going out to sales, finance, legal, customer success. I mean, a, a deal touches everything, right? A deal is is core to what a company does. Um, if there are no deals, there there is no company, um, at least in you know SaaS. So, um, ideally, a deal desk is a function that improves sales at a company and improves process. Love that. Um, so thanks for elaborating that for, for me and for our listeners. So yeah, of course. I, I told our listeners uh, and you, one of the, the reason I found you was because it was just through Google. I found GitLab has this whole handbook, not just deal desk, by the way, but a whole handbook on um, how to do, how they function as a company. So not all links are accessible, even though it's pretty open. Um, so for example, some like company decks that would probably have very, um, specific information they don't want in their competitors' hands or just in people don't need that information. That's not public, <clears throat> excuse me, but I would say that 90% is public or at least 85% when I was exploring on it, it was actually, it's, it's an amazing site with so much information that I have to stop reading it because I could just spend eight hours on it to see how GitLab functions. Um, and see these processes that they feel comfortable um, putting out. So maybe talk to me about this. I think it's called a guidebook. Uh, talk to me how this guidebook started. Talk to me about what your role is with the guidebook and, and what the guidebook does for the company um, and why you guys, and I think you could begin why it's public in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. So we refer to it as our handbook. And uh, I'll start by saying I, I very much cannot take credit uh, for, for the concept. So uh, to go back a little bit, GitLab is the largest all remote company in the world. So company's been out here for over 10 years, and we have never permanently had an office. There are more than 1500 employees in almost 70 countries, fully remote, no office anywhere. And so how do you facilitate a productive work environment when that's the case? You know, there is no office to go sit in a conference room and discuss policies. One of the company's values is transparency. And, and this all sort of comes together into this public handbook where we give our team members and the public a view into our processes. And we, we kind of, it, it's like, you know, we democratize information in that way. We make information available to everyone that we can in order to make us more productive. You know, with the handbook, I don't have to spend time explaining to someone at the company what a policy is on X, Y, or Z. I can send them a link. And that's how we operate at this company. And I think it makes us a lot more efficient. I think it makes us more productive. And I think it just makes things easier. Now, my role in the handbook is related specifically to deal desk. Uh, the, the GitLab handbook is kind of company wide, and it's it's really comprised of more than two thousand unique web pages. That's a lot of content, and that's a lot of different varying content. Uh, you can learn everything from deal desk processes to uh, you know uh, some sales processes to uh, our CEO's cat's name. Everything's on there. Uh, not everything, but most things. And for me, my role is to oversee and manage the deal, de deal desk pages. When we have a, a process that's created or changed or removed, we memorialize that in our handbook. You know, um, last year, we created a new bookings policy that spoke to when we can take bookings, what are the revenue concerns in doing so, you know, as we follow ASD 606 and and um, general revenue guidelines. There's a lot of different 
processes, policies that touch deals. And we make those public, um, not only for our sales team, but for sort of the world at large. We want to share how we're doing things. It's not perfect. It's not um, absolutely right all the time, but it's it's the it's really a group of decisions that we at GitLab have come to and that we're confident in for our processes. And I think it's great to be transparent and open with the world. And it speaks to the kind of open source, open core background that, that GitLab is rooted and founded in. Um, so for me, I think the handbook is really exciting. And you haven't asked, but what's even more exciting is that we, we use our own tool to manage it. So anyone on my team can go in and update our handbook page, whether it's fixing a typo, rewording some language, or adding a brand new process. And I personally have the power to merge that into our handbook. So not only is it something that we manage, it's something we can we can self-serve and, and really manage ourselves without uh, a, a need to to go up to you know an executive level or anything. So it's just really exciting to me because it's like it's like a virtual home base for all of the things that we do. Um, and, and that makes us, you know, I, I think a better function for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's really incredible. Um, I, I recommend everyone that's on this, if you're traveling, then don't go to the website, but if you're at home or at your desktop, go to the website and look at the, uh, the handbook. It's just, but, but lock yourself at least an hour of your time because you'll, you'll go into it too deep. Uh, as as Jesse mentioned, it has two, um, how many pages? Two thousand. It's over two thousand unique web pages. Wow, incredible! And, and growing. <laughs> right, and these aren't like short web pages, by the way. <laughs> um, so, and it's also, I would say, it's not your like, it's not, it's much more than a knowledge base because a knowledge base has like, from my experience, it has like it answers specific questions you have, but it doesn't go about about the full processes. It doesn't go into as much detail as your um, handbook does. Would you agree with that? I definitely would agree. You know, a great example is this page that we have called sales order processing. So at GitLab, our deal desk is, is sort of unique in the sense that we've actually com combined the deal desk and order management functions. So deal desk being sort of, uh, you know, quote to signature, if you will, and order management being post signature. How do we book that deal that we got signed? Uh, what are our requirements? And our sales order processing page goes into all of our unique requirements to book deals, to accept deals. And, uh, you know, we, we outline based on route to market. There's a lot of ways to transact with GitLab. You know, we, we sell directly. We have a thriving channel businesses. We work with some alliance partners. And, each different kind of route to market has different rules. And we lay them out very publicly in tables, in very detailed drop downs. Um, and that's for dual purposes. That's for our sales team. If they say, hey, how do I get this? How do I book this deal? How do I get credit for this deal? How do I get the customer their license for this deal? Right? What, what processes do we have to go through? It's there. And similarly, it's there for the customer. If we're asking a customer to sign an order form, uh, because that's our policy, they can see the policy. This isn't just a salesperson, um, you know, asking them to jump through hoops. This is uh, a policy that that they can see for themselves on our website. And that transparency, I think, makes it easier to work with us and makes it clearer uh, what the expectations are around, um, you know, transacting with us. And in that sense, it's it's more than just a Q and A. It's 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 very detailed. It's very specific, um, and, and these are core processes. You know, these are processes that affect how we manage our business, affect um, the controls that we have in place to uh, to keep us um, safe and compliant. And um, we keep as much of this online publicly in a handbook as we can. And I, like I said before, I think it makes us better and I think it makes us more efficient. Absolutely. Uh, I, it, it really is incredible. Um, there's two ways. I'm kind of curious, obviously, if it's so detailed, how, 
it must take a lot of time to maintain and create from inception. But obviously then you get less questions later. Can you elaborate on how much time it is maintenance per month once it's finally up and maybe give us some more direction on how long it would take uh, take to create something if that's something you've done? That's a great question because I, I actually just uh, spent most of my day yesterday doing some handbook maintenance. Uh, I would say generally, it's not something that we spend a crazy amount of time on because anyone can make updates. So anyone on my team can can jump in and, and make updates that they need to make. But, you know, if, if we are creating good, strong processes we're not updating them so frequently, right? So if you're initially creating a new page that takes some work, but maintenance, I would say, isn't that time consuming because we're iterating. We're, we're, we're making small changes here and there based on need. We're not updating this thing every day. But as I mentioned yesterday, I spent the bulk of my day uh, creating a new page that um, some folks on my team had been uh, working on building. And then it was finally time to go in um, kind of put my stamp on it, make some changes uh, and publish it. And then, uh, you know, uh, and then it goes into, uh, it's almost, I, I think of it like um, for anyone who remembers MySpace back in the day, how you would have a MySpace page and we all sort of learned HTML to uh, make our MySpace page how we wanted it. It's like that, uh, you know, we published a new page yesterday for our order management function. And I thought, you know, I don't really like, how these headers are, are formatted and how um, I'm grouping subheadings under these larger headings and what the order is. And so I sat there for a few hours, honestly, uh, rearranging everything, trying to make it more readable because it, it's not just that we need to have, you know, the good content out there, make it transparent, but it should be readable. I, I, I actually need people on my team, on our sales team, on other cross-functional teams who are interested in our processes, I need them to be able to actually consume this content. It's one thing to make it visible and to be transparent, but it's another thing to make it readable. And I think that's a little bit how, where my like, you know, literature journalism background comes in. I'm really concerned with making it functional. I want people to be able to actually digest it, take it in, if it's too complicated, too convoluted, not concise enough, um, you know, the, these folks, especially our sellers, they've got deals to sell. They can't spend an hour trying to figure out what I'm trying to say in this handbook. And so it, it depends on where we're at. Anytime there's a new process, that's, that's where we spend more time updating this content, updating our handbook. I launched a new team last year, the order management function. Um, so we've spent a lot of time building process, documenting that process, um, as you would with any new function. So it, it's it's specific to uh, why we're updating the handbook. But um, you know, even even when it does take some time, for me at least, it's a pleasure because not to evangelize too much, but I genuinely love the GitLab tool. I think we have such a great product and. That's the tool we use to do this work. And so I think it, it, it's, it's really, it's fun. It's oh, exciting. GitLab uses GitLab. Uh, you should definitely tell your marketing team about this. <laughs> and <laughs> um, they'll appreciate that. Um, so it's not just um, <laughs> for our listeners. So absolutely. Uh, I think that's, it's really cool. And it's, and it's really um, nice to see. And I'm sure that it saves also you a lot of time on the flip side. Um, I think the next step would be to go deep into this. There's two parts okay. of going deep. One is understanding more what the, the uh, handbook discusses and then two, helping our learn a little bit more about Deal Desk. Um, how does that sound, Jesse? Sounds great, let's do it. All right, all right. Um, so one of the first parts I saw for the Deal Desk uh, piece was that there are six types of requests listed in the handbook, okay? Uh, there's A, basic quote assistance, uh, B, ramp deal, C, uh, flat renewal, D, it sounds like I'm in, who wants to be a millionaire, uh, ICV <laughs> slash ARR review, um, E, contract reset slash code term, and F, um, RFP vendor forms. 
So I was wondering if we could go um, one by one on those six pieces, talk about like what does your sales team need from you when they're asking for basic quote assistance? Like what is a basic quote assistance um, and how does the deal best help? And what, um, what is a ramp deal? Like why, um, how does a deal desk help with that? What is a flat renewal? I think you get it. Um, so we can start with the first one. Um, and again, I, how, how large is your sales team? Uh, so, I, you know, I actually don't have a specific number, but I, I know we are, we're, we're definitely over a hundred. Uh, our sales team is, is global. So like I said before, we operate in almost 70 countries and we have a pretty strong sales presence in uh, North America, all across EMEA, um, and also APAC. So uh, mm-hmm. we've, we've got, we're very distributed. So it, it's, it's a pretty big team and, and growing, as you can imagine. Perfect. So there's 100 sales, more than 100 sales reps. And then how many deal desk people are on your team specifically? So my team fully, including myself, is 13. Mm -hmm. Uh, Four of those are order management professionals. So I've got a total of of nine deal desk team members, including two managers. Okay, cool. Perfect. Thanks. And now I think we can understand, now that we understand your company. So what are some basic quote assistance questions that you get, for example, on a daily basis? Do you get a lot? Do you get more from certain people? Um, Is it like an 80-20 kind of rule? Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so let's step back even. Uh, basic quote assistance. Now, uh, at GitLab, we've invested a lot of time, a lot of tooling uh, to make quoting self-service for our sales team. Meaning that in, in most scenarios, our sales team members are expected to build their own quotes. Uh, they are, uh, you know, as as folks like to say, the quarterbacks of their deals, right? So it, it's on them to, to create the documentation to memorialize that deal after they spent so much work uh, and time uh, building a deal that meets the customer's needs and GitLab's needs. Now, that's not to say that every salesperson is an expert in quoting. How could they be, right? And so while we expect our sales team members to uh, manage the quoting process and build their own quotes, Um, there's a lot of reason why they might need our help. Uh, You know, we we put kind of thorough instructions on this very page on the actual clicks that you need to make to create most quotes. But like anything else, this is something that gets nuanced, you know, especially if you have um, sales reps creating deals that are a little complex, they might need a review or they they might say, hey, I, I got this error. Um, can you help me figure it out? And in many cases, that error is not an accident. That error is a guardrail we've put in place to stop them from doing something that we can't accept. And so when when we say basic quote assistance, it can be anything from, hey, I got this error. Can you review this request? Or, hey, I built this quote. I'm new. I've been here for two months. This is my first deal. I'm just not confident in the process yet. And I want to make sure that this is something the customer can execute and we can accept. Uh, And we will. Um, but you know, our, our focus on deal desk is on the more complex strategic deals. Uh, that's where we would like to spend more of our time. So that's why really we've created this self-service environment for sales so that we can focus our efforts on the more complex deals like ramp deals. Now to get into that, uh, we call out ramp deals here because the way that our tooling is set up a salesperson cannot create a ramp deal on their own. Now, a ramp deal kind of high level is uh, a multi-year deal that is ramping, meaning over the course of that multi-year subscription, the customer is either adding users or the price is changing. Um, So you could have a three-year deal, for example, where each year the customer is adding or maybe doubling their user count or each year uh, we're increasing the discount. Maybe we're um, uh, using discounting as strategy to you know, meet the customer's uh, needs and their budget while also um, you know, doing what's right for our company and, and our pricing. Um, and we work with our sales team on those because they're complex. Uh, they require some manual elements to our order forms to make sure that uh, we are properly 
displaying what we're selling and when, uh, when it's not a flat, um, you know, multi-year deal, same price, same user count throughout the subscription term. And I think a ramp deal can be um, a good tool when used correctly in sales, because if you're really being strategic with your customer and thinking about their needs, any company wants its customers to need their tool more and more as time goes on. Any company is going to want their customer to add users um, to use their tool, right? And so a ramp deal is a chance to bake those additions in in advance, right? You can of course buy a three-year deal and then at any point add users, talk to your sales rep, but it's one thing to have that baked in. You say, oh, you know what? Um, March 1st, uh, I, I've committed an additional 100 users uh, in advance, so I don't have to slow down when I realize I have more need. I can just keep going because I already have that. Also, kind of third item here, flat renewal uh, is a lot simpler than that. Uh, it, it does not ramp. It's, um, uh, you know, customer maybe is just renewing for what they already have. They don't need more. Um, you know, we, we are focused on growth and helping our customers uh, grow their functions. I believe that. Um, GitLab the tool is something that is going to continue to, to add value to our customers. And, and I hope that most of our customers, uh, so, so really th these are different ways to, to sell deals. Uh, like I was saying, we want our customers to expand their usage of the product. I, I was saying earlier how much I love to use our product to update the handbook. And, you know, I would hope our customers uh, use our product and and love to use it so much that they have to keep adding users. So whether we bake that in or whether we're working with customers throughout their subscription to add users uh, based on their need, uh, really what you're seeing here in our handbook is just different ways to, to, to transact, different ways to uh, bake in user counts and uh, and sell deals that that are going to meet the customer's needs. Cool. I love it. It's, it's so like detailed and interesting. Um, cool terming. I'm skipping a few of the, the CD, um, the C and D, but you mentioned adding seats in the middle. Maybe you can uh, define for our audience what co-terming is. And I think it said contract reset, which is, I'm not sure what that means. Maybe you can talk about yeah. that. Well, uh, co-terming really is, is co-termination. It's, it's, uh, it's really creating a, a second deal that um, ends at the same time as another deal, right? And a contract reset, uh, in many companies might be referred to as a rip and replace. Um, it, it's really um, uh, a, a tactic that we use to sell a brand new subscription, um, cancel out the previous subscription uh, with the new one in its place. And, and that's another kind of complex deal scenario that our sales team members can't execute on their own because of our processes and our tooling and our, you know, sort of approval requirements. Um, but that's just another way to deliver values to our customers based on, on what they need. You know, maybe you have a customer who bought a deal in March for 12 months. We sell 12 month deals minimum. And, uh, you know, come the end of the year, they say, you know what, I just got all this new budget or I have all this budget that I have to use before the end of the year. Uh, can we kind of stop here and start over? Uh, and, and we can work with customers to do that. We, we want to deliver the best customer experience. Uh, and if that means you've got some budget and you want to use it for GitLab, uh, we're going to find a way to, uh, to help you do that, right? So a contract reset is sort of a tool uh, to do that. Uh, but, you know, I'll, I'll say throughout all of this, right, throughout the conversation of the complex deals, the ramp deals, the contract resets, um, it, these are not hugely common at GitLab. Uh, I would say that we have, you know, predictable deal structure um, and our sales team members largely uh, sell rather simple, straightforward deals. Uh, I, I think our, our product is, is so strong that, that we're able to do that. The reason we call these items out, these complex deal scenarios, is that they're not standard. They are by nature non-standard. And we're calling them out because something that's non-standard um, needs to be explained, right? Are, are, these are not scenarios that our sales team members are encountering every day as they sell and as they you know, craft and structure deals. Uh, so we use this page to go into detail about what those processes look like um, because you know, if I'm an enterprise account executive, 
and I'm selling, you know, however few deals a quarter, I'm not going to be well versed in the sort of admin side of it, right? Because this is just not something I do all the time. It's not something I do as much as maybe an SMB account executive who is selling a lot more deals um, in the same period who are naturally just have the muscle memory, right? So that handbook is, is as much as a source of documentation as it is a tool for enablement. Mm -hmm. Meaning like a sales rep might even have, it might give them the imagination that you could do a contract renewal, for example, um, or that you could stop a contract and start a new one because it's laid out there. Sure. In a sense, it's like a menu. Right. <laughs> you know, what are, what flavors of this deal can I, can I come up with? You know, do I want a simple uh, uh, 12 month renewal for what the customer already has? Because that's what they need. That's my grilled cheese. Or, you know, do I want this, uh, this complex uh, three course meal that has different elements? It might take a little longer to cook, uh, but it's going to maybe satisfy the palate a little more. There's your ramp deal or your contract reset. So uh, it, it's, it's, um, I don't know why I just made a food metaphor. Maybe uh, I'm hungry. Jesse, the journalist, time. the poet, the, the food critic. <laughs> <I love it. laughs> uh, no, it makes a lot of sense. The way I'm viewing Deal Desk from our conversation is that the Deal Desk helps you create more revenue because it lets you go against the rules and, and be imaginative within the guardrails, uh, within guardrails. So let's people explore things that, that are not traditional, squeeze out that revenue. Squeezing is a, a little derogatory, but take, uh, create more revenue. And then um, without like anyone getting really upset then because there's a support team, the deal does to help you. For sure. And I'm glad that you mentioned guardrails. I, I think of the deal desk as uh we walk a very important thin line. So the deal desk at GitLab is part of sales operations. We are in the sales department. We are aligned to sales. It is our role to support sales, to enable them, to support deal creation, deal structure, uh, and hopefully drive more revenue. But at the same time, we are, we are kind of guardians of and protectors of this company. Our our policies, our finance policies, our policies around revenue approvals, um, you know, all the controls that we have in place, um, the deal does seem in the same breath, we're, we're, we're driving revenue, but we're also protecting the company. And we're making sure that our deals are compliant with our, our stated processes and procedures. Um, so we, I really, I, I think of the deal does scroll almost as you're a little bit like a politician in the sense that you have to please everyone while remembering the bottom line, which is uh, we're running a business here and uh, you know, businesses have rules and uh, processes to uh, protect itself and, and everyone. So how do we uh, make sure we're, we're focused on um, reinforcing those guardrails for sales while enabling them? Um, it's, it's it's a it's a careful line to walk, but but that's our role and that's our our function really in this company is to to do that. It's super interesting. I quite I imagine it's a you want to be friends with the sales team, and the sales team wants to be friends with you because they need you. But you also um, understand you have to put your foot down, you know, when when you have to. Um, yeah, I think that's another. By the way plus one for the handbook because then it's not you putting the foot down. It's the handbook that was created as a company and as a team um, that already has the rules and the guidelines, um, which might make that conflict resolution a little bit easier from a deal desk perspective. 100%. And, you know, a lot of these policies that end up in the handbook, the handbook is, is, is the end of the line. They start elsewhere and we can point our sales team to, where we had this conversation, where finance said, you know, we need to have X procedure in place or legal said, we need to, we need to make sure we're complying with Y rule and, and how that entered into a process. But I think what it's all about is trust. 
we have to build trust with our sales team and we have to build trust with our, our, our legal teams, our finance teams, our other corporate teams and business functions um, so that everyone trusts that deal desk is, is helping drive the correct decisions for everyone, for the customer first, for the company, for the sales team, uh, across the board. We have to have that trust and we have to make sure we're, um, we're driving results with it. Mm -hmm. I had a previous podcast and we talked to a similar thing in a different, with a diff, about a different topic, but just the, the idea of trust, transparency and teamwork. I feel like that's like a recurring thing that I've seen on the podcasts um, from CROs to deal desk managers. I think everyone can agree that that these nearly soft skills, if you will, where you're like, oh, you don't see the revenue is super critical to revenue, actually. Um, I agree. I couldn't agree more. And I think I think uh, for myself and my own personal journey, it's skills that have have enabled my success. You know, no, no one no one goes to school and says, I want to do deal desk, right? Not yet. <laughs> not yet, not yet. Although, you know, I will plug, um, uh, there is the, the deal desk association group in LinkedIn uh, run by someone named Stephen Chung, who's uh, really great and, and making a lot of efforts to um, evangelize and, 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 and tell the world about the deal desk function. So I hope it's growing. But, but for now, you know, we're in a place where it's still niche enough that uh, no one is, um, no one plans for that career, but you fall into it. I think if you have um, one of several backgrounds, whether it's legal finance, sales operations, what have you. And, and I think you have to be a people person because like I said, you, you have to build that trust. You have to build those relationships. I need my sales team members to be comfortable coming to me or any member of my team to just talk to say, Hey, you know, I, I just had this call with the customer here's their budget, here's what they want. I'm having a hard time trying to give them what they need based on that budget help. How can we structure this? Um, and it's not even always about budget. Sometimes, you know, it's about the product itself. On Deal Desk, we also have to uh, learn about the product and, and, and understand how it works because that influences how we sell it. Um, and building relationships and, and honestly having casual conversations with folks is a way to achieve that knowledge. Um, I, I, I don't, I'm not in a role where it makes a lot of sense for me to meet with you know, our product managers all the time, but I like to, because I like to understand how they're driving the product and, and what changes they're making and how that might eventually affect our sales process. And I think that that mindset has made me personally successful and our deal desk function successful because we're, we make sure that we're involved further upstream than maybe we might be um, to make sure that the processes we're managing, creating, changing, removing are helping drive the business forward based on what everyone else is doing. That's great. Um, Jesse, I can tell you that I trust you. And so <laughs> I imagine that um, I, I'm hoping that your sales team also trusts you. I imagine it would be hard not to. Um, Jesse, I'd love to talk more. I think we could talk more about this for hours. Maybe we'll have to do that again for season three of our podcast um, and hear more about your career journey next year. But this was amazing. I think everyone here should check out that handbook. Um, where can they reach out to you if they have any questions about the handbook or the processes or just about deal desk in general? I would say uh, head to my LinkedIn. Uh, I, I'm trying to make my LinkedIn a slightly more exciting place, although uh, I don't spend too much time on it, but uh, I, I'm definitely happy to connect. You know, I hear from, from uh, new deal desk professionals all the time, and, and it's a pleasure to, to share advice. Something I've learned in, in, in participating in this deal desk community is the imposter syndrome is real, especially when you're in this niche uh, function where no one has all the answers, but some of us have uh, had a little bit more time to explore different ways of doing things. I will never say I have the right answer because I don't. And uh, half the time, just like everyone else, I'm shooting from the hip, but I'm happy to uh, you know, collaborate with folks and, and share ideas and, and, and give feedback. So um, you know, thanks for having me. And, and I would love if, if anyone's interested in learning more 
about Deal Desk or uh, you know how we do things at GitLab. Connect with me on LinkedIn and let's chat. All right, amazing. Well, thanks, Jesse, and thanks to our listeners. Hope to um, be with you all next week.